Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in our series of live career webinars brought to you by HOP. HOP stands for the Hertfordshire Opportunities Portal. It is a website designed for young people and students in schools and colleges in Hertfordshire. So it's one that we very much hope that you will become familiar with if you don't already know it. Um, the purpose of these webinars is to give you the opportunity to hear directly from people who work in an industry that you are interested in and want to find out a little bit more about. So first of all, for those of you that are watching this webinar live, so it's Thursday afternoon, um, well done from coming home from school, um, going to your computer and logging on to this webinar. So it's a really good investment in your time. And we hope that the next hour or so will be really valuable for you in working out what your next decisions might be about a levels or GCSEs or college courses that you might choose, perhaps looking a little bit beyond that to ultimately what job you might be doing in the future. So we've got three excellent panelists today who can tell you all about their careers and roles within sports development. So use this opportunity to ask any questions to them. I know that when a few of you registered, you've already submitted some questions. So that's great. And we will incorporate that within the conversation that we have. But the second part of this webinar really is to open it out to you in the live audience today. So you can put your questions to those panelists. So the way that you do that, you'll be relieved to hear you haven't got to say anything. Um, we don't need to see you to say it. All you need to do on the questions tab on your dashboard, if you click that, you can open it out and it produces a text box. In the text box, you can type your question in there. It will only be visible to me, and then I can direct it to whichever of the panelists um, is most relevant to go to. If you've got someone in mind that you want to answer that question, then do put their name at the start of it, then I'll know to direct it to them. The other bits of housekeeping to let you know is that we can't see or hear any of you in the audience today, so, so don't worry about that, uh, but hopefully you will be able to see and hear all of us. This webinar is being recorded, so if you can't stay through to the end of it, and we aim to go up until about 5.30, it will be available to watch on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So again, I'm just gonna put those um, social media handles up there for HOP. Um, it'll be available to watch tomorrow. If you watch it, take part in it today, and you know any of your friends that might be interested, um, or any of your school friends or, or family members, then you can direct them to this as well. Although we will try and keep this fairly Hertfordshire centric today, we are giving you lots of really good broad information about sports development in general. So I'm sure it will be um, of some use to your, to your friends as well. Um, first thing I'm going to do, though, you've heard enough from me now. So I would like to introduce our panellists for you today. So just going around the screen as I see you, if I call your name, if you could just introduce yourself and, and tell everybody a little bit more about you. So first of all, good afternoon, Charlie White. Hi there. So my name is Charlie White and I work uh, here at Saracens Foundation. Um, it's the charitable arm of Saracens Rugby Club. Um, and we're going to a little bit later around kind of what we do here at the charity, uh, my background and where I've come from. So that's thank you. Much. Thanks for joining us, Charlie. And uh, good afternoon, Matt Rayner. Afternoon all, uh, my name is Matt Rayner. I'm one of the one of three strategic leads at Heart Sports Partnership. We're a county-wide organisation uh, that's funded through Sport England. Um, and I'll kind of explain a little bit more about some of the work that we do and, and how I kind of work in, in my history around sports development. So pleasure to be here, thanks. Thank you. And then I'm also delighted to have Tia with us today who has only recently graduated. So Tia, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Tia, so I work alongside Matt at the Hartsfield Partnership and I've just graduated from the University of Hertfordshire doing a sports studies degree, but mainly focusing on sports development and business management. Thank you, and yeah, we'll be, be very keen to delve into what you what you studied on that course, Tia, why you chose that course and a little bit more about your next aspirations. Um, so look, first of all, I'm going to ask Matt to answer this question, partly because I prepared him for it in advance, but I suppose it's that top question. So what do we mean by sports development and how does this, how does this differentiate from perhaps sports coaching or sports performance? Uh, thanks. So I suppose sports development is a very, very loose term. Ultimately, it is quite specific in the fact that it's all around promoting uh, and part promoting opportunities around participation, uh, promoting the benefits of sport and physical activity and sports projects. Um, so that could be delivering a year long campaign or program. It could be a very, very specific event. 
Um, so that could be around something like this. This could be classified as the development of sport, i.e. hopefully encouraging some of you that are on the call to be our future sports development officers. Um, and it could also be working with and within specific sports foundations or specific national governing bodies of sport, people like Charlie uh, and others who work in and around the county. Sure. OK, well, thank you, Matt. That's, that sounds like a, a really good answer to me. Um, Charlie, just explain it within the context of, I guess, well, Saracens Rugby Club, first of all. Um, what is their foundation, first of all? And what sort of things do you and your team do on a daily basis? Yeah, so directly linked to sports development. Sport is used as a tool to change things within your community. So you're looking at the communities most at need and then you're using sports bring people together and change behaviours, attitudes, perceptions, um, and get more people active and involved within the community. So I think for, from a charity point of view, that's what we do. We go out into the community, uh, engage people. That. Sure, okay. Um, and then Tia, I'm, we had a really interesting conversation earlier in the week. I, I think as you were going through school, you would think thought you were going to go into sports coaching or sports performance, but actually you then decided that sports development was the better option for you so could you just explain that journey that you that you went on and what sports development means to you well when i was in sixth form i done quite a lot of work with the the younger years so year seven to year nine and doing like sports leader programs and and helping them out across that and um, then when i went across to university um, a few of my models were in sports coaching and before this i hadn't even heard of sports development didn't know what it was but then actually i wasn't that interested in the sports coaching as what i thought i was but was more interested in in sports development and i think i suppose i find myself to be more academic rather than than practical so i think that's why i leaned more towards the sports development side and then for my dissertation done work experience in a secondary school and i didn't realize it but it was probably my worst nightmare um, you don't realise how much goes into like lesson planning or doing planning for practical sessions and I just realised maybe that's not something that I want to do but rather be more behind the scenes. Sure, okay. I mean Matt is that fairly typical? Do a lot of people um, who say, end up in sports development, do they come starting with having had an aspiration to go into sports coaching? I think there's a total mix. I think definitely from a, you know, coaching is is the easy the easy thing that everyone sees. So especially for, you know, youngsters, you, you've got your community coaches who you see um, every day. You've got your PE teachers. So they naturally kind of got an affinity to, to coaching and leadership roles um, within the sport. But then actually sports development and quite a bit of it is, as Tia said, is the behind the scenes work. So a lot of what Charlie and Tia do on a daily basis and a lot of my team is, is we're behind the scenes. You don't see that. We enable those coaches um, and those leaders and those teachers to, to hopefully do the best job that they can do. Sure. Okay. And then, Charlie, coming back to you, you presumably then within the foundation got a really good mix of you know coaches that are going out there and they're on the ground and and then the development workers as well. I mean, I'm just interested just to try and conceptualise this for, for people watching. You're in your tracksuit at the moment. So someone in sports coaching would be in, a, I guess, in the tracksuit most of the time. But sports development, is it a tracksuit role? Is it a smart casual? It's a whatever you're oh, comfortable in role. Yeah. So we, we tend to have kits. So we're ready for anything. So actually, if we need to jump down and go and help on a session that we're able to do that. Um, but if we're in the office and we're... Um, putting in for grants or we're looking at how we can support different people within the community as doing our research, it's literally, you're always ready to go. Someone says, right, let's go, let's get involved. Um, and I think that that's the nice thing about sports development. You can keep up that practical basis, but you can do the theory behind why people want to take part in sport and you know how it can benefit people um, both on and off the pitch. So it's quite nice. You get a whole mix within sports development. You get a whole mixture. I never think you leave the front lines of sports development. So it's always nice to, Go and see actually what's happening and be involved that way. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm interested in know from you, Matt. Just could you give us a bit of context within Hertfordshire about some of the organisations that might need sports development, I guess, officers or, or, or managers or staff? 
Yeah, absolutely. So you've got um, you've got kind of the, the key clubs, so to speak, within Hertfordshire. So you've got um, Charlie over at Saracens. You've got Watford Foundation uh, associated with the football club and, and Stevenage. So you've got those kind of three big sporting arms. And then in addition to that, you've then got big coaching agencies. So some of you on the call might know the likes of um, an Apex, a Premier Education, those that are affiliated and they're delivering after school clubs, they're delivering holiday activities. We've then got all of our national governing bodies of sport. So Hertfordshire, uh, Hearts Rugby or football, cricket, netball, they've all got different forms of sports development within that, whether that is developing and increasing the number of leagues that they've got, increasing the number of teams, um, enabling a, a community sports club to be in a better governance situation, more financially stable, especially since COVID, really enabling them to diversify what they're about. Um, and then also, you know, part of sports development is also working really closely with our primary, secondary schools, further education and higher education. And then in addition to that, you've just got outside of that is those that you wouldn't necessarily see as mainstream sport but are more involved in your kind of physical activity so you, all of your leisure providers so when you go to the swimming pool when you go and book a tennis court or a badminton court or you're utilizing you go for a walk in the park and there's a football pitch all of that has an impact and we have an impact in a sports development sense so everywhere you look sports development can can be a part of your community yeah, so that's a follow on question for that. I'm going to ask Tia to answer this one first of all. It was a really interesting question that came in during the registration, actually, which is the person said, they, they may well be on the call at the moment, that I like sports, I just don't like playing sports. So is this a good career for me? Now, Tia, I know that you do really enjoy playing sports, but equally, could this be a role in a career for people who just want to keep involved in it, but not necessarily play? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think within sports development, there's so many different roles that you can play. That for someone who loves sports but doesn't want to play, there's so there's a wide variety of things that you can do. So even with our, within our team, we have people who work on summer camps. We have people who work with um, health. We've got people who work around coaching and clubs, and myself who work around children and young people in sport. So. If you don't like playing sport but like the impact that sport has i think it's a perfect role for someone sure okay. um so let me come back to you then i'll, I'll get charlie and, and matt to answer this as well just interested to know what does your average day look like what sort of things will you be working on what sort of places will you be going to um i mean take, take today for instance if, if you like but otherwise anything else that looks like an average day um, I think it's very different. It depends on what role you do. So for myself, I work on children and young people projects. So sometimes I might go to schools to look at PE league meetings, which is talking with primary schools um, around Hertfordshire and um, talking about different projects that we offer. Or this morning, we've done um, a visit with Saracens uh, rugby ladies team. And we're going to schools to deliver an assembly and a masterclass with girls. So really it's a wide variety of things. Sometimes you might have a day that's got a lot of meetings or sometimes you might be at camps. It just depends on the time of year really. Sure, then Charlie, thinking about you and your, your colleagues at Saracens who are in development roles, what might an average day look like for you? Yeah, so it's, it's so diverse really. So anything from obviously going out into community and delivering projects to meeting people and networking and finding out how you can be best utilised within your community. It can be going to some crazy events that you get to go to. So, for example, we have like the big um, showdown, which is at Tottenham Stadium. So I know like a lot of people will follow football. Um, well, we take people that have um, danced with us throughout the year at our projects and then they get to go and do a big performance. So it's such a range and you get some really cool experiences working within sports development I think things that you potentially wouldn't do on a day-to-day -day basis and that you'd probably never expect doing there's lots of things that um, for example we work within prisons and crews and I can imagine for a lot of people that wouldn't be something that they think they'd get to be able to go out and do and experience so I think there's so many things that we do kind of on a daily basis and it's never the same literally sure. never the same every day is different yeah, so it sounds like there's a good healthy mix there of you know being in the office and you know meeting people and actually getting out there, um, you know, literally on the field sometimes uh, in in schools and various community groups 
as well. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask you the slightly more challenging question then, um, which is, I think we've spoken about lots of the really enjoyable aspects of the role at the moment, but are there more challenging aspects of working in sports development that we should probably share with the audience at the moment? Yeah, the, I mean, I suppose they call it work for a reason, don't they? Um, so, you know, the, the, there, there are a huge number and, you know, Charlie's highlighted some getting the opportunities to go to an amazing event like that. But that event, you know, someone's got to run that event. So someone is there, has got to crunch those numbers, has got to deal with uh, risk assessments and those bits or an injury to someone. So there are the, the kind of the nuts and bolts. So, you know, you might not have an interest. I've got someone in my team who loves data crunching and numbers and things like that. And that's, you know, maths is used on a daily basis for, for us. And for some people, they just don't like maths, but they, they have to do it because they're delivering a program, you know, a, a holiday camp and they've got to buy the kit. They've got to book the facilities, pay the coaches and all of those lot. And they've got to make that work within a budget. Um, there are other people. So I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of writing funding applications, but ultimately to work within sports development, we've got to, you know, sit down and type and explain to someone, you know, explain to the banker, Sport England, uh, Big Lottery, whoever it might be, um, why sport is really important. You know, so you've got to think there and explain to someone who doesn't know what it is you do and why you should be funding this project, this program, this organization. Um, and then there are, the, there are the meetings that you sit there that have got very little to do with you and you get your five minutes of fame um, to sell your project or your program you know you can often but but that's what sports development is is you're always competing um, you know it is a competitive world and when I talk about that I'm not talking about on the field or on the playground or something but you're competing with people's time so you know ultimately for us we think sport is the best thing in the world but you know People are very, very busy and kids have got a huge number of opportunities and we want every single young person to be playing and enjoying and participating in sport. But some kids don't. So that's part of our challenge is going, right, how do I get that kid who hasn't enjoyed PE at school? How can I now get them to enjoy going, you know, doing park run, you know, going for a run, going for a health walk? getting on their bike and going for a bike ride, getting them back into swimming. So sport isn't always competitive, um, but there are some of the real challenges. And, and there always are your ups and downs. Um, you know, it is a funded organisation and we're always scrapping for every single little bit of penny we can get. Sure. OK. So look, do you, think, do you think it's fair to say then, kind of in summary then, that um, people who work in sports development are going to have a real passion for sports, physical activity and, you know, you know, in leisure, even if it's not their aspiration to go into you know, coaching and to do those performance roles. Absolutely. You know, one of the one of the key members of our team uh, at the partnership is is the lady um, who looks after our HR and our finance and all of those bits. We've got someone else who focuses solely on all of our marketing and our communications. You know, these are there are lawyers who work in sport and Ch Charlie can probably explain a little bit maybe about the depth and the breadth of Saracens. You know, you've got lawyers, HR consultants, you know, the full range. It is a, it's an organization, it's a business. And if you've got a little bit of passion for sport or you loved it, or, you know, you, you're a big rugby fan, but you've never really played it, or you're a big swimming fan or whatever it might be, you want to get involved. You don't have to be a sports coach. You just got to go, do you know what? My expertise is in finance but I want to do it in a sports context. Absolutely. You know, the industry and the sector would welcome you with open arms. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, let's just move the conversation on a little bit, because this is ultimately, I think, what everyone will, will want to find out. But how do you actually go from having that interest in sports and that passion for, for getting people uh, playing sports and, and being physically active to, to actually having a job in it at all? So, Tia, let me start with you and I, I will just caveat um, be coming to you first because we're going to talk about your degree that you've just done um, by saying that this isn't a career that you have to have gone to university for so if you're watching this at the moment and thinking I really want to do this but I don't think I want to go to university stay with us but I think Tia will be able to explain to you the benefits and the things that she learned from it so Tia first of all talk us through which what subjects did you do after GCSE so did you stay go to college did you go and stay at A levels and what was your thought process to go into university and which course you were going to do right, so when I finished my GCSEs I went to sixth form not in my school but 
in another school and my subjects were I did BTEC sport which is equivalent to one A level I then did sociology and psychology um, and I did maths for a bit but we won't talk about maths um, and then I think for me when I was applying for university a lot of the courses that I applied for were um, sport and exercise science to then go on to do my QTS to get my teaching qualifications and then I think one thing which is most important when you go to look at universities is to sit in on a taster session of the course that you're going to do because the worst thing is to go into university and, and start a course that you don't like so I went in and I done a taster session on the sports and exercise science and I think I just zoned out and I didn't really enjoy it and I thought actually uh, the science and it's not what I want to do so I then went back to look at different courses that I could do and I saw at sports studies and um, so within my degree I did uh, sports ethics which is essentially like the sociology of sport so you look at feminism and racism and loads of different things and how it affects sport in general but then also athletes in sport um, and we covered sports coaching sports business management and sports development I then went back um, to come into another open day to look at this course and I thought this is much more interesting I would be more engaged in this so I just went and done that and then within my first year you have to cover everything and then when you get to your second and third year, you can then pick what you think will suit you so after my first year I dropped sports coaching and focused more on the sports development and um, sport business management and just went on from there really and you get quite a lot of opportunities on the degree that I did to go and work in different places just to gain that work experience in different fields to see maybe I'll try this and then if that's not for you you can then look at other viable options. Sure okay so, so just say that again to, what was the name of the course that you you eventually did at the university? So I did um, a sports studies degree however um, at the University of Hertfordshire that's just one big umbrella so underneath that you could do a sports coaching degree, sports development degree, sports business management or sports and psychology but I just took the the broad degree because I wanted to look at every single opportunity. Sure okay thank you. and then but Matt and Charlie I know that you were both sort of crazy about sport when you were at school so just talk us through your choices that you made after GCSE school. Matt you go first. Uh, yeah so for me I was uh, I was more down the sports performance route so um, I did PE, uh, chemistry and biology at, at uh, for a level um, but ultimately my kind of aspiration was solely focusing on playing rugby um, that then enabled me to get a, a place at university but again my focus was was kind of on playing sport and the way in which it happened is is I then fell into doing a sports development degree um, which I picked up a bit of coaching and uh, and I was quite fortunate in that regard um, but ultimately you know I think I was I was surrounded by people at university and before I went around school who were like you need to keep going with your studies and I know you want to just focus on the performance side of playing a sport and I think I was quite fortunate that I was surrounded by those individuals that kept that going um, so I, I think for me my journey was slightly different I was quite fortunate that that's where I ended up um, but I've got others who kept on the performance side who didn't go to university um, and then, you know, that then we're very much like, well, now what do I need to do? Because that performance and, I, and I'm sure Charlie can speak a little bit maybe about the athletes that she's worked with previously that didn't have the academics behind them. And ultimately, you're not playing high performance elite sport when you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, and for me, even in your 30s. So. Yeah. OK, well, I mean, Charlie, can question to you and I know first of all let's just say that you went to school in Hertfordshire didn't you so tell us about um well, t tell us where you went and then tell us that route from sort of 16 onwards yeah so my, my relationship with um studies was a little bit different and um I went to Stanford school um and was at Stanford school doing a levels um and then I, I wasn't very well for a little while and then ended up actually failing my a levels which at the time seemed like the absolute end of the world um, but luckily we managed to uh, get on to a foundation degree at a local college which is North Hertfordshire College 
um, yeah. and then progress on to the um, a degree and actually studying the same thing as Tia, so sports studies at the University of Hertfordshire. So it's a very small world. Um, but I, I think like from a from a point of view, you don't necessarily have to have obviously that academic background. I know for me that that was a massive struggle. Um, personally, I know a lot of people that's not necessarily the route they go down to get into sport. Um, but I'd say it's interesting because um, from, from the point of view of sports event, and we've spoken about this already, is that you don't necessarily have to ha go, there's so many pathways and directions to get into sport. And a lot of the stuff is around putting yourself out there into different environments and getting to know different people and networking. And maybe it's you go and do a coaching course and you meet people through that way, or you put yourself onto a leadership program and, or you just, I know like um, I met Matt years ago when I was um, doing the National Youth Council. So it's just different ways of networking to kind of get to your end goal. So if it doesn't work one way, definitely approach it from other pathways because there's so many opportunities to get in sports development. Sure, okay. well, I mean, that really nicely answers that second question there of do I need to go to university? And the answer is no, you don't. But of course, Tia is a, you know, an advocate of higher education and we can see the benefits that she's gained from that. I mean, Matt, let me come back to you. If you were 16 again and you had full choice of options for what you were going to do, are there any particular subjects that you would really recommend someone to have a look at if sports development is something they've got a real passion for? Um, I think for me, uh, so I do a lot, quite a lot of recruitment, make sure that you knuckle down and get the best GCSE in maths and English you can possibly get. No matter what career, whether it's sports or anything else, that is that is the one thing that will always be a minimum requirement. Thereafter, it's then around you as a person. Don't feel that you need to do this or you need to do that. It's actually, uh, and Charlie spoke and both here, it, it, this is a lot about people. So it might be that you've got a real interest in psychology and you want to approach how you do your work from a psychological perspective. Well, why don't people want to do sport? Why don't people want to go out for a walk? Why do they want to do that? You might be really interested in the science side. You might be really good at the finance and the maths and things like that. Do subjects that are meaningful to you and then it's all of then about the story so when you go for an interview or an opportunity throw yourself at it and and kind of open yourself to going well actually this is this is me and this is who i am and this is the impact that i can have as an individual but ultimately you know i was pleased with my a levels i enjoyed those subjects it was something that i was relatively good at from the science side stayed away from your histories and your geographies and things like that but you know i look at my wider team i've got officers with English degrees, geography degrees, people with no degrees, people who went to university and then quit after two years because it wasn't for them, people who you know, started in the coaching industry from 16 and then have done qualifications throughout their, throughout their time. So there is, there is no one path um, that will get you to exactly where you want to be. I think it is around just, especially if you're younger now, so in the position of those that are listening goes, Give yourself the opportunity to go and be a volunteer, go and, you know, go and do DV, go and Duke of Edinburgh Award, go and do a leadership course at your school, become a, go on the National Youth Council, go and do things that will enable you to reflect on that practice and start to have a bit of an impact because it is a, it's a people's industry and it's all around the people and you as a person. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, you, you're doing fantastically well, not only answering the question I've asked you, but then also ans answering the next one as well, which is which is great because it means that I have to I can talk less. Um, <coughs> Charlie, you I'm sure will recruit young people into the into the industry. What would you look for on someone's CVs, either in terms of subjects that they've studied or um, experiences that, it, that they've gained? Uh, I definitely think looking at CVs, it's what is above and beyond what everybody else is doing. So what experience have you got um, within community? What have you done that is meaningful and um, shows you as a person? So I know like here we have um, four values, which is around work rate, discipline, humility and honesty. So a lot of how we um, select people is based on them values. So it's, it's making sure that you've got stuff that stands out from everybody else that um, you're seen as passionate and you, you bring that across when you're applying for jobs, you're interviewing. Um, 
So yeah, I definitely say it's it's the above and beyond stuff that's going to yeah. make you stand out in your CVs. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I tend to find that I've got industry experience as well, that people in sports development do naturally tend to go beyond. I mean, if you think back to if you think back to school, it was always the PE teachers that are there on Saturday mornings organising games, pitches, and I, I guess that's a, almost a sports development element of of their role as well. Um, is, Tia, is, is that something that you became aware of that being in sports development, you, you tend to do more than the standard nine to five work? Um, I think so. I think you see, especially in our office, we're uh, a nine to five, but you'll see a lot of people who are who stay after five o'clock or you'll you'll be on like a laptop after five o'clock. And it's not that you, you need to do it. You sort of just want to to get involved with things and get things done. Yeah. OK, so look, what I want to just get some reassurance from you all now um, so on behalf of our audience is that getting a career in a career in sports development is a in demand and B can lead on to better things. So as a Matt, if I could come to you, first of all, more holistically across Hertfordshire, can you just reassure everyone that, yeah, this is a career that there's going to be huge demand for people in in the future? Absolutely, there is. You know, sport has been a part of, you know, the history of this country from from day dot. Um, you know, and Tia and Charlie and myself. You know, if you do go to university or you study at a GCSE PE, it it is there. Wherever you look, there is. There's going to be swimming pools. There's going to be football pitches. You know, the Premier League is not going to die uh, a death. You know, tomorrow. So, uh, and hopefully, it's there for forever. So, all of those clubs have got. Um, they've got foundations and they're developing because they want to find the next best player. Well, ultimately, you've got that performance pyramid is the bigger my base, the more people I have participating in my specific sport, the more opportunities there are for me to find my superstar. And every single sport is trying to do that. And then they're also trying to just get people to enjoy sport, to come and attend, to come and watch, um, to come and participate in their own time, to get out, you know. COVID was shifted the dial hugely around the number of people who put their running trainers on and went for a run. You know, you saw the whole bike industry of, you know, just literally overnight, everyone was buying bikes and home equipment. And hopefully, you know, the more people we can have working in sport and pushing that, you know, you you increase that demand um, locally. And we want young people in Hertfordshire to stay in Hertfordshire and, and develop those opportunities themselves, whether that's working for an organization that exists, or you might be an entrepreneur. You might want to set up your own company and run, you know, boot camps or run your own coaching company or run your own sports development consultancy. Those jobs exist exist all over Hertfordshire. Sure. So the second part of that question or that slide, Charlie, is what are the prospect for someone? So once you've gone into sports development, what skills and qualities and experiences are you gaining and where might they, they lead you in the future, if not within sports development? I think there's all sorts that you can literally go into. So I know a lot of people that have started here and um, they've ended up going into jobs in the business side. So there's lots around sponsorship, commercial, there's loads around um, business in general, I think. When you look at sport, it's not just kind of what goes on the pitch, but it's all the back office stuff. So it's like finances, it's literally everything that goes into it. So I think there's so many different opportunities. If you've got a, a foundation in sport, you can then branch off into different areas within sport. Yeah, and then I mean, Tia, you're brand new into the industry, so I'm sure you're not thinking about leaving it yet, but how do you see your career developing and progressing? I think for me, like working in sports development, it's all about uh, like reinvesting into the community. And there's so many things that you can do with it. So it's not just locally, but you can look at working in sports development internationally as well. And you could work with big like organizations that's working with the Olympics, working at world championships, world cups, because everything is being reinvested through that. I think for myself, I probably like to go out and get my masters focusing on the sociology and sport and working around tackling inequalities in different organizations such as like the Premier League so working around like racism and working in promoting like female sports different areas such as that sure okay so just thinking about those synergies between sports development and sports coaching 
Matt. Do we tend to find more people going from A to B or, or B to A as they progress in their career? Um, I think people are more likely to start in coaching and then end up in sports development. Um, there are always opportunities in sports development to continue your coaching. Um, and also, if, you, if you've got a passion for sport, you can pick up coaching roles. Um, but yeah, in general, you, you tend to find those that kind of start coaching end up in, in sports development. But just to kind of continue on, the, the previous question is, I look at previous colleagues in sports development who are now working in the police, working in the charity sector around um, children and young people, so hearts young homeless. They're working at, in local authorities and councils um, as a kind of planners looking at active travel. Um, those things. So it is it is a real broad breadth. It gives you such a base around project management, event management. You know, Charlie tucks on the finance and the business side. So it is a real opportunity to, to meet a huge number of people. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you. I think that answers that question really nicely. Um, and now we're going to come on to the questions that have been submitted. So there's a number that have come in through the uh, questions tab, which I've got here. If you have your questions that you want to ask, do get them in now uh, so we can put them to, to Tia, Matt or to Charlie. I've also had a number of questions that came in through the initial registration as well so really keen to get these questions in. So first of all what do you do when you don't know which area in sports you would like to get involved in? Um, Matt that's, I'm going to ask you that question to start with because I, I guess you don't know what you don't know but the sports industry is, is absolutely huge isn't it so where would you even start to think about where you were going to specialise uh, So start somewhere. So, you know, Tia touched on, she did she did a bit of teaching. I did a bit of teaching, didn't enjoy it. Um, I've loved coaching, but I don't like coaching kids. Um, you know, I coach adults um, and that's absolutely brilliant. I've got colleagues who wouldn't go anywhere near with coaching adults. They, they love coaching kids. Get out and do some leadership stuff, you know, come and do some work experience you know if you're at school now you've got loads of opportunities for work experience we take work experience on and if we don't um, i'm sure saracens have got work experience opportunities give stuff a go you know get out there get it an opportunity to try something and then you might not like it opportunities like this um but yeah open doors which will then close another door and go oh, i didn't know that exists and jump into it but yeah there are opportunities galore so don't worry about not knowing just give it a go sure i mean charlie i'm asking you a slightly leading question sort of based on my own experience I, I used to work in a for a premier league football clubs foundation program so does everyone in your team are they mad passionate saracens and rugby fans no and that, no not at all so people come from all different walks of life really and um because obviously we're a charity that are looking at different needs within the community. We try and get people from different communities. So they have different passions, they have different focuses. Um, but just to go back to the point previously, um, I think around a lot of stuff is around trial and error. So have a go at it, be out of your comfort zone because that's where you grow the most as well. So if you're not sure and you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure whether I do, just go and do it. Because if it, you don't like it, that's fine. You've learned something from it. So uh, yeah. yeah. Definitely not all big Saracens fans. So, uh, yeah, just interesting. And it, actually, it's nice to have diversity within team because you don't want somebody that, or people that are all coming from the same perspective. Absolutely. So, I mean, based on my own experiences, I was a big fan of the, of the football club that I work for. Um, but I know that I had colleagues in there who couldn't have told you who the team centre forward was or whether who they played on at the weekend or even what colour kit they played in. But they were fantastic in their development roles that they knew everything there was about health and fitness, for instance, or about inclusion sports. So that was never a prerequisite. So I, I suppose I would say to everybody, and I, I think you probably all echo this, don't you know shut the, shut the doors on a sport or a particular organisation or club because you're not a fan of them or because you don't necessarily know a lot about that sport. Uh, or team, um, it's it's more around the qualities that you've got. Tia, I mean, have you been? Has it surprised you just the range of organisations and, and roles within sports? And I'm sure you're coming across things that you didn't know existed as well. Yeah, I remember my first day at the Heart Sports Partnership. We had our monthly team meeting, which is about three and a half, four hours long, and there was loads of acronyms getting flown left, right, and centre, and I had no idea 
what they meant, no idea what anyone was talking about, but it's sort of just getting stuck in and getting yourself involved in everything. Because then that way, if you do that, you know, well, oh, actually, I don't like that, or that's really interesting. So you get to look at a variety of different things. Sure. Uh, just looking at some of the other questions here, I'm going to sort of amalgamate these because they're all around A-level subjects. Um, so a couple of questions here. Someone who wants to go on to study sports science, which I know is, is, is just a little bit off centre from the things we're talking about today. Um, entry requirements for that. I mean, is there any better advice other than just make sure you look at the UCAS website and look at particular requirements? Or is that something that either of you, any of you, you know, I would, sort of I would I would make sure you've got your sciences uh, and the best grades but again with it look on the UCAS but I think the, the biggest advice I can give when you're applying for university if, if that's the, the the angle you want to go down you've all got a personal statement and it's a personal statement um, so exactly as Charlie and Tish you know throw yourself at it get some learning well this is what I want to do because I didn't enjoy this I didn't enjoy this and I think this is where my strength is um, but yeah, UCAS, every university and every course is slightly different. Sure. Okay, Jill, I think we've probably gone through all the questions that have, that have come in. If you have got a question, this is your very, very last opportunity um, to, to put it in, so, so do get it in now. Um, just on your screen at the moment, you'll see there's a couple of websites on there and a couple of QR codes. So Matt, first of all, do you just want to explain what is Sport England um, and what sort of information might someone gain from that website? Yep, so uh, Sport England is a uh, funded, nas uh, funded national partner from the government. Um, so they are the, the department that looks after sport in our country. Um, so they fund all of your national governing bodies of sport. Um, can't believe, I don't know the exact figure, but it's in the 50s. Uh, I think I want to say about 58. So that is your, uh, your football association, your rugby football union, your uh, England athletics, um, all of those, so they fund all of those. They also fund organizations like uh, ourselves. Um, so there are 43 active partnerships um, and they also fund what they call strategic partners. So some people on the call might have heard of organizations like Street Games or the Activity Alliance that focus on national uh, disability sport work and things like that. So ultimately Sport England is there to support sport um, within, within England. Um, there is Sport Scotland and Wales, um, but that just focuses on England and they do a huge amount around advocacy work, helping organisations like ourselves promote and develop uh, community clubs. They provide funding opportunities. Um, most of you or some of you on the call might have been to the school games um, throughout your career or done some leadership things in schools or know your school games organisers, depending on where you are. Sport England funds those people who come into your schools as well and deliver on the school games. Um, so, yeah, they are front and centre of, uh, of what sport is about uh, within England. Sure, thank you. And then, um, Charlie, I've, we've got a link on there through to, to your website as well. And I'm just looking at it at the moment. There's a really good section on there about working for us and a volunteer section. Just tell us a little bit about how you would use volunteers and, and what that process is like. Yeah, 100%. So we've got volunteers from literally all walks of life. So people that um, just want to come and give up their time because it's something they're interested in or you've got people that are going through and doing their Duke of Edinburgh or they know somebody that's experienced X, Y, Z and they want to um, get involved. So I think volunteering is, is one of those things that obviously looks really good in your CV as you're building up your CV kind of for your future but also it's a feel-good vibe. It's um, something that you get to know people, you build your networks um, and it, it does bring you kind of that social connection and happiness. So Volunteering is definitely something that everybody should do. Like I'm, I still volunteer on top of everything else. I know probably people within this room still volunteer as well as their full-time roles. So again, that's something that will set you apart. So again, you can have a look at uh, the website um, and do be cheeky, ask for opportunities to volunteer and um, get your name out there. So hopefully we'll be hearing from some people from this school. That'd be quite cool. I'm sure, I'm sure we will. I mean, again, just looking at your website there, I think it's really good for anyone to have a look at, you know, whether rugby is your passion or not, but just having a look through the range of different programmes that you offer as well, I think, I think that's probably good knowledge for, for anyone to have so they can see um, the, the sort of range of projects that are available. Um, 
Oh, another question here. I don't know. I might be able to answer this one. But what's the kind of things you can do inside a Premier League club? Well, Matt, you, you mentioned the um, you know, so Watford who aren't in the Premier League this year in the in, in the Championship, but sort of, uh, are up and down in the Premier League. Um, they have a big community program. Yep. Are you able just and, and Stevenage as well, Stevenage FC. Yep. Are you able to explain anything about the sorts of projects you know that they do? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Watford do a huge range of projects. So they do, uh, they run a program called Kicks. Uh, so lots of uh, football clubs around the country run a program called Kicks, which is a free um, kind of like moonlight football session for young people uh, within specific areas. So Watford will be funded to work around specific geographical areas. They've also got a, a wide health program. So they work very much in their community on health and well-being. Um, they do quite a bit around education. Um, so they're in local secondary schools. So they've got um, sports coaches, mentors, those that are young people who might have made um, kind of poor decisions, um, got themselves in a little bit of trouble with the law and actually go, well, here's an opportunity for you. Ever thought about football as an opportunity? Um, Watford as a trust also, we, you know, we talk, they've got marketing officers. They've got, um, you know, they've got finance officers. So there is a full range. And then they've got just your football coaches who go out and deliver after school programs. Um, they work with us on some of our holiday provision, providing opportunities for young people on free school meals. So another really, really good website to go and have a look at. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in those, uh, a friend of mine works over at Aston Villa um, and I've got a friend who works at West Ham as well. So and they do very different jobs. So if that is an area of interest, just get on the get on those foundation websites um, and have a look at the different works that they do, because that will provide you an understanding of, of what sports development opportunities there are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, see, let me just ask you, are there any other websites or organisations that you think people might be pleasantly surprised by and they could they could find out a little bit more about their programmes? Um, I do know one of my friends works for Bloomsbury Football Foundation and they work on similar things to us, sort of they work on half camps, but they run like football academies, they work closely with La Liga. And also if you go to Kick It Out website, they usually list a lot of... Um, like community foundation roles within football. So they'll have a lot of roles in there. And I know sometimes they run like internships as well. So there's loads of places to look at if that's something that you want to get into. Yeah, absolutely. So look, there's there's a whole variety, there's a whole range of, um, of different employers out there and potential avenues for you. So if, if football is your sport, it's a national sport, every professional football club will have a community program or a foundation um, so, so go and have a look at their websites, go and find out more about them. The information is quite readily available. Absolutely the same with, um, you know, in, in rugby, cricket and all of our other um, elite and professional sports as well. Um, I think we're probably going to wrap up there because I, I think you've answered the question so well for us today. We've probably covered those. So hopefully for those of you watching this, uh, you found it really useful. Hopefully it might make some impact on the decisions that you're about to make ahead of what you're doing for GCSEs or, or further beyond. If you have got any nice feedback for us, if there's anything that's really helped you today, just drop it into the into the chat in the questions now because that's good for us to use and we can use it as, as feedback. Um, on your screen at the moment, uh, you can see the QR code that will take you back to HOP. You mentioned, I mentioned HOP right at the start. This is the platform that um, we use to use all to display all these webinars and hop is a host of information for you around careers in Hertfordshire as well the qr code at the top will take you straight through to our virtual encounters page so every webinar that we've run over the last two and a half years is available to watch back on there we have done one on sports coaching specific that was a couple of years ago and we had someone from watford's um, community trust then talking about their foundation degree program so you can find that via that QR code link there. Uh, do follow us on HOP as well. Um, we'll produce lots of information that will be hopefully relevant for you that you can use. So in closing, let me first of all thank those of you in the audience um, who have contributed some really good questions. Thank you for registering. Hope this has been useful. But more particularly, can I say thank you to our three panelists today, so to Tia, to Matt and Charlie for giving up their time and for sharing their experiences with you. So thanks so much and hopefully, um, we have got your future workforce watching this at the moment who want to come and work for you and uh, be part of that sports development network within Hertfordshire in the years to come. Thank you. Okay, wishing, wishing everyone a very good evening.